Let's pray. Lord Jesus, empower your word that it would touch us deeply, change us eternally. In Jesus' name, amen. We begin a new series today. We've, we did an Old Testament series on 12 Hebrew words, and then we, we did a theology series on the covenants, covenant theology, and now we're doing Ephesians. And for eight weeks, we're gonna look at Ephesians through a very particular lens, though. What does the book of Ephesians say about who we are? What's our identity? One of Paul's primary purposes in writing to the Ephesian church is to remind them who they are. And that's my, my hope today. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, this is a picture I took in Ephesus a few years ago. Uh, Ephesus was an amazing city in the first century. It was the second largest city in the Roman Empire. Um, at times, more than 300,000 people lived there. That's a pretty big city, second only to Rome. Uh, tied with Alexander, Egypt, about the same size. Uh, and it was full of people uh, packing the streets. It was the metropolis of that, of that day. Uh, it's right on the coast of Turkey, modern day Turkey today. And so the trade routes all moved through there and it was a bustling seaport where goods from all over the Roman Empire uh, came in. It was laid out in a typical uh, Roman fashion with paved colonnades and roads everywhere. And along each one there would be shops and vendors selling their wares, their, their goods to everyone. And, and people would march up and down. Uh, it uh, had one of the largest libraries in the world uh, with, with some half a million books. When books were as precious as they were, that's a pretty extraordinary thing. This is the, the front of the Ephesus Library. Um, it had an amphitheater uh, that seated about 30,000 people who would come for music or for speeches or for dramas. Uh, it was Rome away from Rome. This was the happening place in the world of Paul's time. So, so let me take you back and I want you to try to picture what it would have been like to live in Ephesus in the first century. You would wake up in the morning and there would be sounds of the city, not car horns like we get in New York City when we're there, but, but the sound of animals and carts going up the cobblestones, uh, sounds of vendors shouting for what they're selling and what they've got. Um, but there'd be a different sound in Ephesus. You would hear the pilgrims. The streets were almost always filled with religious pilgrims. You see, Ephesus was the center of the worship of the goddess Artemis, also known as the goddess Diana in, in Latin, same person. And it was the center. Uh, and so hundreds of thousands of people came every year to Ephesus to worship this goddess Artemis. And so every morning there was a parade down the, the column streets, across the cobblestones. They were playing music and, and singing songs. They were shouting out their love for Artemis. And every morning you'd hear that. And every night you would hear that. You'd, you'd also hear the temple prostitutes inviting you to come out and join them for their walk up the hill. Because at the top of the hill, this is an artist's rendition of the temple of the goddess Artemis. It's seven times larger than the Parthenon in Athens. It was one of the largest structures ever built at that time. It's not there anymore, just a few columns because it burned down in the fourth century. But it was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. People would come from forever. Now, now why such a big temple? Well, it's a busy city, but, but Artemis was the most popular deity to be worshiped in the entire Roman Empire. Everybody who was anybody wanted to 
worship Artemis. And in fact, Artemis is the, the mother goddess. She's the queen of the earth. They call her the savior of the earth. And people worshiped her because she was the god of the fields and the flocks. She was the goddess of fertility. So if you wanted to have good crops, you had to give an offering to Artemis. If you wanted to have your, your sheep or your cattle birth with lots of little ones, you need to, needed to pray to Artemis. If you, wanted, if you wanted money in your bank account or in your, in your pocket, you needed to pray to Artemis. But, but even more than that, if you, if you wanted to get pregnant, you prayed to Artemis. When you were pregnant, for a safe pregnancy, you prayed to Artemis. If your children got pregnant, you have to understand that, that about one in three um, births cost either the life of the mother or the child. Very difficult time to have. A, so everybody who, who had, a, had a family wanted to pray to Artemis, that they would have a good pregnancy and that their children would be healthy. And if you didn't have enough children and you wanted more kids, you'd have to pray to Artemis. And um, because Artemis was the goddess of all life, um, you could actually take a little statue of her to your house and, and almost every house in the Roman Empire had a little niche that they could put their idol of, of Diana or Artemis in so they'd be blessed, you see? Oh, so, so it was prosperity. You want prosperity? Pray to Artemis. Um, you want healthy family? Good kids? Pray to Artemis. But there's one more thing. Pleasure. Artemis was the goddess of pleasure. Everything that had to do with procreation, everything that was sexual was about Artemis. That's why in the temple, there were so many erotic acts that took place all the time. That's the part of worship was, was eroticism, sexual eroticism. So if you wanted to have all the pleasure in your life you could muster, Artemis is the one. No wonder she was so popular. Think about it, you get prosperity, you get a healthy family, and you get all the hedonistic pleasure you could ever want. No wonder everybody wanted to worship Artemis. And they came from all over the empire to Ephesus and filled its streets. And, and because any kind of offering was suitable to Artemis, people brought everything and, and it became the wealthiest temple in all of the Roman empire. So, so imagine trying to be a Christian in that city where every day money and prosperity and eroticism was worshiped. How hard it would be to live amidst that stream. Almost everybody you meet on the street, if you were a Christian, would not be a Christian. They would be here in Ephesus for Artemis. And in fact, the whole industry of the city, much of it had to do with Artemis. You, you remember that Paul, who makes a, uh, a kind of a missionary center out of Ephesus because it's so, so influential, um, he starts converting people. He preaches in the temple, not this temple, but the Jewish, the Jewish synagogue. And uh, he preaches and people start to come to Christ. The spirit moves and there are conversions. And one of the silversmiths who makes his living making little silver altars for people to take to their houses and worship the goddess Artemis is so angry that they start a riot. He starts a riot and Paul escapes on one of his missionary journeys just with his teeth. Um, that's the story of, of Ephesus. Um, it strikes me that to be a Christian in Ephesus would be very difficult. Kind of like being a Christian in Denver. Because our culture worships the same things, doesn't it? Doesn't it worship success, prosperity, have enough, do enough, buy enough, you deserve? Um, doesn't it worship health? Go to this club, take this pill, do this exercise, here's the new medicine. Uh, doesn't it worship whatever it takes and, and pleasure? You, you should feel good, you should have some extraordinarily pleasure-filled life. I think all of those are Satan's normative ways of attacking us. Don't trust God, trust yourself. Get some money in the bank, you'll feel better. Don't trust God, 
take a pill, it'll make you healthy. Exercise at Orange Theory, it'll make you healthy. And it probably will, by the way. Um, but my reality is that we look externally to solve things, and the Lord is trying to work internally to say real health comes there. Pleasure, whole billion dollar industry set up on pleasure of people. This is the world that we live in. We know it had an effect on the Christians of Ephesus. They struggled as a minority in Ephesus. It wasn't easy to live in that city. Um, and, and they did some things well, but they did some things badly. How do I know? Well, Revelation chapter two tells us this. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, this is Jesus speaking to the people in Ephesus, to the Christians in Ephesus. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have preserved and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. The people, the Christians living in Ephesus have not quit in their faith. They're, they're in church. They're the ones that showed up this morning on one of the lowest attended Sundays of the year. Uh, you guys, the, 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 they have applied energy. They've resisted giving in. However, living in Ephesus has cost them something. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. And do the things, repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. What the Lord says is you do all the right outside stuff and you hold to the truths of the gospel, but somewhere along the road, that passion, that love, that intensity, that first love has died. I get it. Jesus is my job now. It's easy for me to, to read scripture and look at, okay, what are the three points in the poem that that will lead me to? Or to, uh, to pray through through things as a, as a part of my job. It's much harder to just fall deeply in love with Jesus again. I've been a Christian for a long time. And at the beginning, the passion that I had in my belly and my heart to follow the Lord and do whatever he wanted was intense. And when I was ordained, I can remember saying, wherever, Lord, whenever, however, till the day I die, I want to serve you but it kind of becomes a part of our life. Do you ever unconsciously drive? You get in your car and you find out, how did I get here? This is not where I was supposed to go, but your, your mind just takes over and leads you to the grocery store, to your work, or, or wherever. Or, or you find you're halfway there, and you go, oh, I don't know how I even got here. I think that most of us do the same thing with our faith. We put it on kind of unconscious pilot. It takes us where it takes us. We go through the motions. Doesn't mean we don't believe. It doesn't mean we don't love Jesus. Doesn't mean we don't care about God or the church or our faith. It doesn't mean we don't give or read our Bibles, but it, what it really means is we are not in love. Somewhere along the line, the Ephesians in the 30 years from when Paul writes the book of Ephesians and John writes Revelation, they lose their love of God. Think about the height from which you have fallen. It strikes me that Paul writes Ephesians so that we will not do the same thing. He does not want them to lose their first love. And so he writes to them and he reminds them of several key things. Um, one of the problems with social media, by the way, is that we define ourselves by it. If we, if, if we put something on Facebook and a lot of people like it, 
we feel good about ourselves. If we put something on Facebook and nobody even comments, we think, where are my friends? How come I'm here by myself? We use different mechanisms of, of measuring us. It's why the suicide rate amongst teenagers is just skyrocketing because everybody puts their best stuff forward and then if you don't get affirmed for it, it, it reflects back on your identity. Who are you? Who am, am I? And Paul recognizes that the Ephesian church, in the midst of all the paganism and, and flowers and abundance that is there as one of the wealthiest cities in the Roman Empire, it's gonna lose their first love, they're gonna lose their identity. And so he reminds them and that there are three things, not social media, but I wanna to tweet to you three things. The first one, hashtag God has a plan. If you're not into the Twitterverse, uh, you might not really get the whole hashtag thing. It's kind of a summary. What's the summary of what I just said? You hashtag something and in Twitter it becomes its own little thing. So the first point of Ephesians chapter one is hashtag God has a plan. The second one, the summary statement is hashtag I am chosen. I am chosen. And the third tweet is hashtag identity is key. Identity is key. Those are the three things that Paul's gonna talk about today. If you would open your Bibles, let's take a look at Ephesians chapter one. And I'm gonna just run through the whole chapter quickly. Verse one, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Notice how he starts. Not only with, with his authorship, but why? I've been chosen to do this. God's got a plan, he's got a will. To God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. To the people who are there in the city. It's probably a circular letter, probably written to all the churches in that area. They'd read it at one place and then they'd have a messenger carried to the next place and they'd read it again. It's not just for Ephesus, but, but Ephesus is the, is the center place that he's speaking to. And then he gives a typical greeting, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse three, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. What does he say? The first thing I wanna remind you is you are blessed. You are blessed. And it's not just blessed in the prosperity of the world and the prosperity of the city. You've been blessed with blessings in the spiritual places, in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Verse four, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. He's talking about God's plan, that before the first molecule was made, the first planet came together, God knew your name and my name. He knew our lives and he chose us to be a part. And, and not only to be a part, but to be holy and blameless in his sight. He not only chose who we would be, but he chose that he would interact with us in such a way that he would bring his righteousness to us. Verse five, in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. What he says is he's not just making us somebody special according to his plan. He's not just making us someone holy or righteous according to his plan. He's making us his kids. It's different. It's different. We, we were out with my grandkids, by the way, who are the most beautiful and smartest kids on the planet. Um, but, uh, but I was talking to my, my oldest granddaughter, Abigail Four, and she said, um, I said, what do you want for dinner, honey, at this restaurant? I want mac and cheese. 
wow, I love mac and cheese, honey, but that's not really possible right now because there's no mac and cheese on this menu. You can't have mac and cheese. But I want it. I know, I kind of would like some good mac and cheese too, but you know what? We don't get to have mac and cheese tonight and we're at this restaurant and we're, we're celebrating Uncle Nick's birthday. He picked this restaurant and there's no mac and cheese on the thing, but I want mac and cheese. I know. And probably sometime this week you'll get mac and cheese, but tonight we're gonna pick off this menu. Let's go through and you get to pick something. And if you can't find anything that you like, you don't have to eat. That's up to you. So you want a hot dog? No, I want mac and cheese. You want a hamburger? No, I want mac and cheese. We finally go through and finally we negotiate down to chicken fingers. You know, will you eat? Well, I'll eat one. Okay, we'll get you some chicken fingers. And uh, it struck me how hard it is to raise children, how hard it is to have kids that you're invested in. It, you know, I'm not sure if it wasn't my child, I would have put the energy, my grandchild would have put the energy into it. It's hard. Well, it's an amazing thing. If she would have said no and thrown herself on the floor of the restaurant and kicked the chairs over and pulled down the tablecloth and caused a mess, you know what I would have done? I'd have left her there. <laughs> Find somebody else to be your granddad. I am out of here. Now why are you laughing? Because you know it's not true. You know I couldn't do that. Even, even if she was acting in a totally horrendous way, she's my kid. She's my family, she's my grandchild. I might pick her up, throw her over my shoulder kicking and screaming and carry her to the car for a little talk, but I would never abandon. I love her not just because she does the right thing, even if I help her do the right thing, I love her because she's my kid. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will. You guys are God's kids. Sometimes you throw temper tantrums and you don't find what you want, and you're not happy, but you are God's kids. Verse seven, in him we have redemption through, the, through his blood and forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Um, we have redemption in the blood of Jesus, a covenant picture. We have forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace which he lavished on us. Those are symbols about the, you can't have too many sins because God is rich in grace and he will lavish on you all that you need to cover your sins. We, we've heard that before, but, but Paul's trying to remind the Ephesians, don't forget who you are. Don't forget that no matter how much you sin, God is rich in grace and lavishes on you his love and his mercy and his grace. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put, put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity in all things in heaven, on earth, under Christ. Verse 10 of chapter one is really the core the main verse, that all things are moving toward a time when everything is ordered under Christ. We read it to you again. To put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. There's a plan out there that God's working and the ultimate ending place, the final score will be when God says all things shall be under Christ in heaven and on earth that shall all be. And you have a plan, you've been chosen, you've been shown this. God's at work in you. Verse 11, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for his praise and glory. What Paul says to the Ephesians is, 
you've been saved and chosen and redeemed and adopted, not for your own good, but to be a part of his plan so that we also might bring praise to God that the, there's a purpose in this. It's not just that I get to go to heaven, that I've done the things that I need to do and God will bring me, but he's got a plan and he wants me to participate with him in this plan. In him we, have also, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. What does that say? Everything that works in this world has already been accounted for, for God. So uh, for uh, Uncle Nick's birthday, we went to this Unser Racing go-kart place. And, and the men and the, the women who were courageous and strong, we put on these Unser Racing outfits and a helmet and a neck brace and we got into these high-tech go-karts. Um, these aren't the kind of go-karts we had when I was a kid. These go 35 miles an hour. That doesn't mean that sound like a lot. 35 miles an hour when you're six inches off the pavement is pretty fast and everybody's whipping around and there's a track and it's got hairpin. It's just really hard. And, uh, and so they, they take you through a little training. This is what the bumpers are around. This is why you have to wear this gear. You can never get out of your car or you'll die. You know, they train you and then they set you off, go. And so I've never done this, but it's a race. And that competitive part of me comes out and I decide who needs the break. I am flooring it around. And I start out and I am winning the race. I am ahead, I am doing great, and I'm barely making it around the, the corners, but I, f I finally get to one corner. I, I've forgotten that you have to slow down going into the curve and accelerate out of the curve. And I spin out. My little slick wheels spin out and I crash into the barrier. Not hard, but, uh, and, and so I'm immediately getting ready to, okay, get back in, get back in the race, and then my son-in-law hits me at 35 miles an hour, crash! sends me spinning down the track. Looks over his shoulder, you know, and smiles. <laughs> and he's off again. Um, and, and I'm a little shaken up to get hit at 35 miles an hour. You know, you're, you're protected, you're padded, you got a four point harness on, but still, it's a little bumpy and my neck's starting to hurt. And so I was like, get back in the race, Brad. They're passing you, get back. So I pull back out and then my daughter, my middle daughter, boom, 35 miles an hour, sends me spinning to the wall again. Now, I hurt my back. I can't move very good. And I finish the race, you know, driving like a grandmother. Not quite, just praying that I can live to the checkered flag and pull into the pit. Um, it was not how I envisioned the race to go. And, uh, and I hurt, in fact, for a week I was sore from these silly bumps in, in these go-karts. Um, but it was the best thing that happened over, that, over our Christmas season, the best thing. All things are working according to his will and plan. You know how I know that? Well, so when we're, we went back into the, into the kind of reception, restaurant area after we had raced and they're like, you okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hit you. I said, yeah, I saw, I saw that look on your face. <laughs> and they're like, no, we, we didn't really mean to hit you that hard and we're sorry you're hurt. And I'm like, it's okay, I'm fine. Just need to stretch it out a little bit, I'll be good. You know, no big deal, typical male, right? I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine, it's okay. Don't, no, I'll, just perfect. Um, and. And what made it the most special was two things. First of all, they wouldn't take the picture of everybody unless they got me up on the, on the stand with them because they said, you should have won. <laughs> and we think you're the winner in our family. And they got it, we all stood up on our little platform and took a family picture with everybody in our fancy little outfits holding our helmets. And uh, they even offered me the trophy. I said, forget it. You don't win it, you don't get it. 
And, uh, and yet there was a moment there where I thought we were all family. I was holding Abigail. She had a chicken finger in her mouth. <laughs> and it was good. And I thought, this is the family God has given me. And then one other thing happened. After, after that picture, they said, uh, Dad, can we pray for you? And all my kids and grandkids, my wife, all the people that were there for the birthday party got around and laid hands on me. And they interceded for me. They prayed for the pastor. And it struck me, the baton is passing. And Lord, you have been good. Every one of those kids and grandkids get it. Every, the littlest prayed. And I thought, I'd do it again. I'd crash again just to have my family together. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. I don't know if you're going through crashes in your life or if your kids are going through crashes or if your grandkids are going through crashes or if your friends are going through crashes. All I'm telling you is God has a plan and it includes spinning out and crashing some. It includes the difficulties to him who works out everything in accordance with the purpose of his will. Verse 13, he says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. What he said is, I, I not only saved you and redeemed you and made you holy and adopted you as kids, but part of your identity is I have put me in you. You have a God tattoo on the inside of your heart. He has marked us more clearly. Everybody in heaven sees it clearly. Every angel that enters a room knows exactly who's been marked. The tattoo glows bright. You know that, Mark. You've met people and you've said, I bet you this person's a Christian. Hopefully people meet you and they say, wow, are you a Christian? There's a mark. There's something in us. He has marked us and given us a deposit that says, nothing can change the fact that you are with me, you are mine, and you are going to finish the race. Don't forget that. Ephesians in the middle of the chaos of this pleasure-seeking, prosperity-wanting world. Don't forget, you are God's kid. He has put a piece of himself in you. You will finish the race. A deposit guaranteed. In verses 15 through the end of chapter 1, Paul breaks into prayer. And he prays two things that I just want to mention. First he prays in verse 17 of chapter one. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you may know him better. What does he pray? Give him more spirit, Lord. Give him more Holy Spirit. Give him more revelation. Give them more wisdom. Why? So that you may know God better. That's his prayer. He wants us to know our identity better. He knows there's an enemy out there that is trying to steal your identity. He wants you to believe that God doesn't have a plan. God is not in charge. God has abandoned you. God is not really at work. This isn't going to turn out okay. That's what Satan's whispering all the time. So Paul prays, give them more spirit that they'll hear the truth. God is with them. God is acting according to a plan from the moment Adam and Eve are birthed in the Garden of Eden till the second coming of the Lord and beyond. There is a plan. And then in verse 18, he says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparable great power 
for us who believe. Wow. He says something interesting. He says, I want your heart's eyes to be open. My heart doesn't have eyes. It doesn't see anything. But Paul knows it should. We should see the truth of the spiritual reality around us. Not get caught up in the people shouting in the streets, follow me, do this, go here, worship this. This is the way. He prays that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, opened up, that we would see the truth, the reality, that the road up to the temple of Artemis ends in destruction and disaster and condemnation. It promises everything and it delivers nothing. Grass in a field, here for a moment, burned and gone forever. That the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you are called. Look ahead, my brothers and sisters. Be hopeful. The, glor- the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. What he says is, you think that Ephesus is a big deal? You have no idea what a big city that is made of gold and beauty is going to look like. Remember, see it. Open up your heart. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. He goes on to say it's the same power that raised Jesus. That's the power that's at work in each of us. The power of God is here. You see, he he wants the Ephesians. He wants us to know our identity. God has a plan. It's a perfect plan and it's all coming together. Even the chaos and the crashes are a part of God's plan. Two, we are chosen by God to be his kids, his family, and a part of his plan. And three, we have an enemy who's trying to take our identity away from us, to make us not believe that we are God's beloved children. We need to remind ourselves let me ask you a question. If you, uh, if you really believe that God has a plan and everything's working out in that way, would it change how you'd worry about life? Would it change how you'd pray about tomorrow? If you really believe that God can handle Brexit and politics in the world and China, would it change how you look at the newspaper or the television? If you really believe that God had chosen you, you were his kid, would it change those moments where you were self-critical or critical about other Christians who were also chosen as his kids? If it's true that God has a plan and we are chosen to be a part of that plan, would it not give us a sense of peace and joy? We need to be reminded, my brothers and sisters, of our identity in Christ, who we are. I wanna challenge you today. Couple of days, New Year starts. This is a a devotional morning and evening, uh, revised, it's by Spurgeon, but it's revised by Alistair Begg. And this is what the elders and I go through every morning. Takes about five minutes. There are lots of great devotionals. I don't really care that you use this one. But if you don't have some way to start the new year with at least a few minutes of reading in the morning or before you go to bed at night, you need to get one. Morning and evening. This is one for the morning, five minutes. Evening, five minutes. And they're amazing. And they change me every day when I read them. I start my day. And there's something kind of special about thinking that the elders in our church are reading the same one with me. And sometimes by email, we actually talk about, did you guys read that today? Wasn't that awesome? I was so moved by that. I want to challenge you to renew your identity in Christ. Don't just... Go about the business. Find your first love. Rekindle your passion for the Lord. Let's pray. What a joy to know, Lord, that um, it's not whether we read our Bible a lot or go to church or give money that really is what you measure. Um, In many religions, those are the kind of things that the gods 
quote unquote, God's due measure. But that's not what you want. You want our hearts. You want our love. You want us to love you first and foremost. You, you say to us, if we have all sorts of things that we do right, if we give up our body to be burned, if we give away all that we have, but we have not love, we are nothing. Noisy gates, clanging cymbals, emptiness. My prayer today, Lord, is for all who are here, for all who are part of this church and, and for their families, that there would be a renewal, a callback, protect us from falling away from our first love. And if we have fallen, Lord, we repent. We consider the height from which we have fallen. And we, we commit to return to you. In Jesus' name, amen.